Someone left me a very encouraging note up here saying they hope I do a good job tonight. I'm going to try to. You got your Bible with you tonight? Be opening up to Romans chapter 1. Romanos capitulo 1, Romans chapter 1, that is where we're going to focus our attention tonight, where we're going to spend most of our time, Romans chapter 1. If you were not here this morning, you missed something very special. We certainly want to extend our appreciation to our shepherds uh, for the work that they did. It was Mitch who was up here doing the talking. Uh, all of the shepherds contributed on what Mitch had to say. They did a phenomenal job putting a capstone on our theme for the year of one another. And I, I walk away from this morning's sermon just so greatly encouraged um, by the stories of faith and perseverance and strength and dedication that we have in this local church here. And isn't it a joy to know that we have shepherds who don't simply serve over us, but shepherds who lead from among us, who know us and who are involved in our lives and involved in our lives in positive ways. And so to Travis and Kent and Todd and Mitch, we certainly say thank you for your good work, and we certainly pray that you'll have many more years uh, serving God as you have been this, this past year. We are wrapping up this study on Habakkuk's statement, the just shall live by faith, and the several times we see it in the New Testament. The last instance of this phrase is here in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, where Paul writes and says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous man or the just shall live by faith. That is a statement we have seen repeated three times in the New Testament, once in Hebrews, once in Galatians, and now once in Romans. And that statement, the righteous shall live by faith, originates, as we saw in earlier studies, in the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2, when God's people were being told to submit to the Babylonians that were invading and go off with them and learn your lesson in captivity and then I'll bring you back and I will restore you. And God was calling on them to act in faith in all that they did. Let's see how this statement is used in the book of Romans tonight and to do that we need to get a little bit of context for what's going on here in Romans chapter 1. Uh, starting at the very base level, Paul is writing to Christians who are here in the city of Rome. You look at Romans chapter 1, and over here in verse 6, Paul is writing to uh, those who are among you who were called of Jesus Christ, all who are beloved of God in Rome. And so he is writing, and that, that's going to be pretty important to the book of Romans as a whole, that the book of Romans is not written originally to a non-Christian audience. The book of Romans is written to Christians, which is going to put a, a, an impressive um, perspective on what we read, especially here in chapter 1. But keep that in the back of your mind. Paul is writing to Christians here in the book of Romans. And though they were Christians, as you look over here at verse 13, though they were Christians... Uh, they still needed the gospel. They needed more of the gospel so that they could continue to grow. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul says, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented thus far in order that I might obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to the foolish. Thus, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Paul had been hindered from going and preaching in Rome up to this point. His hope was to do that. He writes to them to let them know, look, my delay in coming to you and preaching to you and interacting with you personally is not because I don't love you. It's not because I don't care about you. It's not because I'm ashamed of the gospel. It's simply that time and time again, I have been hindered in my efforts to come to you. But Paul says, make no mistake, when I do come to you, I'm going to share with you the same message I have been sharing everywhere. The message of which I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of what? The gospel of Jesus Christ, 
For that gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is God's power to salvation because in the gospel, God's plan to make man righteous is revealed. For in it, the righteousness of God which is by faith is revealed in order to produce faith as it is written, the just man by his faith shall live. So what we want to do this evening and and where we're going to spend most of our time, we're we're going to focus in here on chapter 1 and verse 17. So if you've got your Bibles open, Romans chapter 1 and verse 17 is really where we're going to focus. We'll stray a a few chapters over, maybe into chapters 3 and 4, but we're primarily staying in the book of Romans tonight. So if you brought your New Testament, open up there and let's get started this evening. The first thing I, I want you to notice with me, after Paul has introduced the idea of the gospel in verse 16, right? That, that is his theme. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel is God's power to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So there is the idea the gospel is for everyone. Jesus came and died for everyone. He wants his message to be shared with everyone. And whoever is obedient to the gospel, whether Jew or Gentile, black or white, whatever the difference may be, Whoever is obedient to the gospel will be saved. Continuing on now to verse 17. For in it, in the gospel, pronouns, in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Let's focus first on this phrase. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now what does this mean? In the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. Um. Maybe a good way to to get our minds thinking correctly about this is to ask this question. Why was the gospel written? That that is really what Paul focuses on a lot here in the book of Romans. But if you were to answer that question, how would you answer that question? Why was the gospel written? And I don't think... Any of us would say that the gospel was written simply to tell us that God is personally righteous. We we really don't need the New Testament for that, do we? The Old Testament does a sufficient job of declaring to us that God is personally righteous, that God is personally holy, right? In, In the book of Leviticus, God calls on his people to do what? Be holy. Why? Because... I am holy. Or the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32, it's around verse 4 or 6, where God is praised for being what? He is the rock, he is holy, and he is righteous. He is just. We're not given the gospel to convince us that God is personally righteous. So why are we given the gospel? This really is Paul's theme all throughout the book of Romans. We're not given the gospel to convince us of the fact that God is personally righteous, although he is personally righteous. We are given the gospel because the gospel reveals to us how God makes us righteous, how God makes man righteous, how God can be just and make sinners righteous. Let me demonstrate this to you from the book of Romans. Let's just stay here in our context. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and look over here at verse 22. Romans chapter 3, capitulo 3, verso 22. Romans chapter 3, and verse 22. Actually, let's start back in verse 21, verso 21. Where Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this, but now apart from the law, apart from the law of Moses, The righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, how? The righteousness of God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. For whom? For all those who believe. What we're talking about here, when we're talking about God's righteousness in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17... We're talking about the the method, the way, the means by which God makes man 
righteousness. A, a righteousness that God declares. God looks at someone and says, though you were a sinner, because of this, that, or the other, I now declare you righteous. Uh, we would view that synonymously with forgiveness. Right? That, that's what it means to be justified, to be made righteous. We're talking about being forgiven, uh, coming to new life, having sin taken away. So in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Not God's personal righteousness, although that is revealed. For example, uh, verse 26 For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just, there's personal, God's personal righteousness, that he might be just while still doing what? While justifying the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. You know, these couple of passages here in Romans really serve to answer that question. Somebody says, well, I I just don't understand how one person dying for all of humanity could be enough to take away sin. And God's answer to that is what? God's answer is simply, to me it is. And we might be prone to to like some sort of mathematical equation to spell that all out, right? How is it uh, that the blood of bulls and goats in times past could have been sufficient as an expression of faith in the Messiah to come to take away sin? Or how is it that you and I, maybe we look at some grievous, horrible sin that has stuck with us all of our lives that, that we have struggled with, that God has forgiven us of, but how could God forgive us of that that's so, so painful and so wrong? I just, I just don't understand how. And God simply tells us what? It is enough. The sacrifice of Christ is sufficient. And our role, as we've seen here in Romans 3, is simply to exercise what? Faith. To trust God when he says, the blood of my son is sufficient. It's enough. It will forgive. Look at Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. This principle of God declaring people righteous is not something brand new to the book of Romans. Rather, this is a principle uh, that is seen at the very beginning of the gospel, at the very beginning of God's revelation. If Abraham was justified by works, verse 2, He has something to boast about, but not before God, because what does the Scripture say, verse 3? Abraham believed God, and it was put down to him for righteousness. Who who made Abraham righteous? God did, on account of his what? On account of his faith. What Paul is endeavoring to show his audience here is that this principle of God making people righteous by faith is not something new to the gospel. But rather, this is, if we could call it this, this is a formula that God has worked by in all ages from from history past. God justified Abraham by faith, but not just Abraham. Who else? Verse 6, just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. Here again is God making people righteous on account of what? On account of faith. So back to Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. The focus of Romans 1 17 is not revealing to us that God is a personally righteous being, although that is true. The focus of Romans chapter 1 and verse 17 is much more tailored than that. It is the idea that in the gospel... God's plan to make man righteous by faith is revealed. And isn't that why we've been given the gospel? Now to go back and answer that question, why did God give us the gospel? To show us how to come to him, right? To show us how to be saved. To show us how to be made righteous. And who is it that makes us righteous? 
It's God. In the gospel, the righteousness of God, Paul goes on to tell us, the righteousness of God is revealed. And of course, we've got to keep up with our pronouns here. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed. What is the it? Well, it's the, it's the gospel, going back to verses 15 and 16. What Paul was ready to preach to those who were in Rome. The gospel, which is God's power to salvation. And in that gospel, the righteousness of God is, Paul says, revealed. How is it that you and I learn how to be made righteous? How is it that you and I learn how it is that we're forgiven? How is it that you and I learn how to be just? It's through what? It's through Scripture, isn't it? It's through the gospel. This is why, rightly so, we place such an emphasis on the gospel, why we place such an emphasis on the Bible, on God's Word, because it is in God's Word that you and I learn what sin is, what sin does to us, and the hope of forgiveness that we have available in Jesus Christ and in His gospel. This is why the gospel needs to mean so much to us. It is, Romans 1 and verse 16, God's power to salvation. Out of all of the different ways that God could have chosen to communicate to mankind his need for salvation, God chose the gospel. And if what Scripture reveals to us about God is true, then God choosing to use the gospel to reach us is the best thing God could have chosen to reach us. Right, If we have faith in who God is, that God does what is best, then doesn't that impact then how we view the gospel? It should. That if God has said, this is the means I will utilize to communicate to man his need for salvation and my offer of salvation to him, shouldn't that impact how we esteem the gospel? In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And, and then this is, this is a challenging one. Were you ever in a high school Bible class and you came to Romans 1 and 16 and someone's trying to explain it and everyone kind of sometimes walks out a little bit more confused than when they walked in? I can remember one Bible class teacher trying to describe this and saying, well, uh, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It's revealed from big F faith to little f faith. I still don't exactly know what that means. What does it mean that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel from faith to faith? That's challenging, but it's there, right? And this is kind of in the heart of the verse. It's kind of important, isn't it? And I think if we can get this figured out, it's kind of the key that turns the lock that unlocks the rest of this passage. What does it mean that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith? Well, let's put some pieces together. What do we see in the book of Romans? How does God God make man righteous? How did God make Abraham righteous? How did God make David righteous? And how does God offer to make us righteous today? By means of faith, right? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. And then we get here to chapter 1 and verse 17. What we see all throughout the book of Romans is the reality that God makes man righteous by means of faith. Look at chapter 3 and verse 22 again. The righteousness of God, how? The righteousness of God through faith in whom? In Jesus Christ for all who believe. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Number one, we see God makes man righteous by means of faith. Chapter 4, we didn't read verse 9 yet. Look at chapter 4 and verse 9, capitulo cuatro verso nueve. Is this blessing then upon the circumcised? Or upon the uncircumcised also, for we say, faith was reckoned, faith was put down to Abraham as what? Righteousness. How did Abraham move from unrighteous man to righteous man? 
What was the change? Faith. It was faith. What we're seeing all along, whether Old Covenant, whether patriarchal dispensation, or whether gospel, God has always made man righteous by means of faith. So then look at chapter 5 and verse 1, which kind of brings this whole section of Romans together. Therefore, chapter 5 and verse 1, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through whom? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. So whatever from faith to faith means, number one, we need to understand that God makes man righteous by means of faith. But then let me ask you a question. Why would God reveal to us that he has always made man righteous by faith? Right? That, that's really the argument of chapter 4. The Holy Spirit lays down the principle that, that this idea of being justified by grace through faith is not some new concept, right? God justified Abraham by faith. God justified David by faith. And if God all along has been justifying men and women by faith, then the message to us is what? God still justifies by faith. And if God justifies by faith, then what should that do to us? What should that convince us of? Could I submit to you it convinces us just simply of our need to have faith? Right? Look at chapter 4. Look at chapter 4 and verse 16. Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Capitulo 4, verso 16. In fact, this is spelled out for us here. Chapter 4 and verse 16. For this reason... It is, that that is righteousness, it is by faith that it might be according with grace in order that the promise may be certain to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those of us who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. It is by faith and communicated that it is by faith for what purpose? To prompt us to have faith ourselves. God says, I will justify you by faith in order to induce us, you and me, to have what? To have faith. Look at verse 23. Chapter 4 and verse 23. Actually, verse 22, therefore, we read, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, not to his sake only was it written, it was reckoned to him. But for our sake also to whom it will be reckoned as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Him who was delivered up because of our transgressions and who was raised because of our justification. What does Paul tell us here? This whole lesson in chapter 4 about God justifying people by faith has been recorded and written down for us to move you and me to what? To move us to faith. It was written for our benefit as well. God's plan all along has been to justify man by means of faith. So what is the message here? In the gospel, God's plan to make man righteous is revealed. God's plan to make man righteous by faith is revealed in order to do what? In order to produce faith. That's what this this phrase here, this small little phrase from faith to faith, That's what it means. God has revealed that he justifies sinners by faith to convince us of our need for what? To convince us of our need for faith. And just as an aside, that truth destroys the Calvinistic idea that you and I come into this world completely sinful and wholly incapable of responding to God's message of salvation ourselves. In opposition to that idea, God says, I reveal to the world the reality that I have always justified sinners by means of faith so that I can convince sinners of their need to have faith. 
In the gospel, the righteousness of God by faith is revealed in order to produce faith. But then we get this little phrase, as it is written. Right before we get to Habakkuk's quote, we get this little statement here, as it is written. Again, this is an emphasis upon Scripture, isn't it? Right, Twice now in this short little verse, Paul has emphasized to us the need for Scripture in our lives. We need to read Scripture, we need to understand Scripture, we need to apply Scripture, we need to be engaged with Scripture. It needs to be a part of who we are. It's not just what does a preacher say, it's not just what do the elders say, it's not just what does my priest say, what does my denomination say, what does the handbook say. What does God say in His Word? And we let that rule and guide the day. In the gospel, the righteousness of God, which is by faith, is revealed in order to produce faith as it is written. And then catch this, and and this would really apply to Paul's original audience here in Rome. Scripture alone reveals justification by grace through faith. Some people sometimes have this idea, and I know it's nobody here, but sometimes people have this idea. That, you know, I can go out and I can be as close to God out in nature as I can in the church. And so normally this is the justification when hunting season rolls around, I can go worship God in the deer stand, right? Or when the fish are biting, I can go worship God out, out at the creek, out at the lake, right? And I don't need to be here with my brethren. Anything that I need to learn about God, I can just look at the world around me. And while it is true that God has revealed to us that his created order does enlighten us to his presence. This is, for example, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. We need to note, though, right after saying that, that God nowhere says that just observing the created world around us is enough to show us the reality of sin and God's plan to justify the sinner. If I want to learn about what sin is and how to leave sin behind and how to be made righteous, I don't go out and watch the fish or the deer or the elk or whatever you want to hunt, bear. I know a guy who hunts bear. No. I come and engage with God's Word. Scripture alone reveals to us the principle of God offering justification to sinners on the basis of His grace, accessed by faith. Now, for an entirely different reason, that was a struggle for the Roman Christians. I don't, I don't read any background that a lot of them were keen on getting out in the hills of Rome and going hunting. But what I do know is several of them were struggling with the idea of being obedient to Jesus versus going back and serving, trying to serve God under the law of Moses. In fact, chapters 9, 10, and 11 in the book of Romans really show us that was a big problem here amongst the Christians in Rome. They were struggling with whether or not we maintain faith in Jesus Christ and the gospel or whether we go back and start practicing circumcision and sacrifices and all the auspices of the law of Moses. And in an attempt to pull people away from that flawed ideology, here's what the Holy Spirit through Paul says says, this principle that I'm telling you about of justification by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit says, this is not new. And that's the significance of these four words here, as it is written. What the Holy Spirit is communicating is that this entire plan of justifying man by faith is not a new principle. Rather, it was a principle that was firmly established in the Old Testament. And to prove that point, Paul takes his audience directly where? Takes them directly to Habakkuk and the Minor Prophets, where he quotes, The righteous man shall live by faith. And of course, this is a foundation that we've been focusing on. So now that our introduction is out of the way, let me give me four points. No, I'm just kidding. Don't worry. We're good. The righteous shall live by faith. Point number one is simply 
that God has always offered spiritual life on the basis of faith. This is the consistent story you see all throughout God's Word. How was Abraham justified? Abraham believed God and it was reckoned unto him for righteousness. But Hebrews 11 and Romans 4 and James 2 and passages like that are all going to show us it wasn't simply Abraham saying, okay, God, I believe you. In fact, the very first time we're introduced to Abraham at the end of Genesis 11 and the beginning of Genesis 12. Abraham believes God and it's reckoned to him for righteousness. But what did Abraham's faith look like? Get out of Ur of the Chaldees, get out of your father's house and go to a land that I will show you. And what did Abraham do? He got up and he did just exactly what God said. That's faith. Hearing what God says and doing what God says, that is faith. That's exactly what the Jews in Habakkuk's day were doing, right? What they were called to do. If you don't want to die by the hand of the Babylonians, or then do what? Submit, go off into captivity, and I'll bring you back. But if you try to run down to Egypt, book of Jeremiah, what's going to happen? The sword that you are escaping in Jerusalem is going to find you down there, and that's just exactly what happened. If you want to live, if you want to be made just, you've got to have what? You've got to have faith, but what is faith? Faith is hearing what God says and doing it. That was Abraham's experience. That was the experience in Habakkuk's day. That was the experience of David that we read about in Romans chapter 4. Just as David describes the blessedness of the one to whom God imputes righteousness. Blessed is the one whose lawless deeds are what? Forgiven. What moment in David's life do you think of there? Bathsheba? And his sin with Bathsheba and then how he... Return to God after being confronted in 2 Samuel 12 by Nathan the prophet and the prayer that David offered and the sacrifices that David would have had to offer. We sometimes forget about that, don't we? The many sacrifices that David would have had to offer for his sin. God has always justified man on the basis of faith. Here's a really good way to settle this question in our minds. You remember Israel going to take Jericho under the leadership of Joshua? Do you remember that story? John, why don't you get up here and lead it? No, I'm just kidding. Remember the story? March around the walls seven times on the seventh day. Let me ask you one simple question from that story. Okay? Who knocked the walls down? Was it the Israelites shouting and blowing horns that knocked the walls down? No, it was God who knocked the walls down. But did Israel have a part to play? Yeah. They had to march. They had to shout. They had to blow the horns. They had to do what God said. That's what? That's faith. We're told in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, that's faith. Faith which accesses God's grace. Justified by grace through faith. That's the principle we see all throughout God's Word, and that's what's being communicated here in the book of Romans. And so, what's the implication here? Man moves from spiritual death to spiritual life by means of what? The means by which God makes man righteous is revealed in the gospel. In order to produce faith as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. You want to come to spiritual life, what do you have to do? What do I have to do? Got to have faith. Got to hear what God says. And I got to do it. That's faith. And if we struggle with that idea, as, as we might sometimes, could I submit to you that we just let the book of Romans define for us what faith is? What faith looks like? Two passages. Look at, look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, look at verse 5. What does faith look like? How did Paul describe it? How did the Holy Spirit describe it? Romans chapter 1 and verse 5, through whom? Through Jesus Christ, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about what? The obedience of 
faith. Two peas in a pod, right? Faith embraces obedience. Same thing is said, look at the end of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 16 and verse 26. Romans chapter 16 and verse 26. Capitulo 16, verso 26. But now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God has been made known to all nations leading to the what? Obedience of faith. As the Holy Spirit would describe faith to us here, faith is not simply a mental proposition, is it? Faith embraces the mental, but it also embraces the active. Faith embraces obedience. Faith is not simply thought. Faith is action that God has ordered. And so, as we wrap up, look at Romans 6. That's why Paul comes and talks to the Romans about one specific moment in their lives as Christians. One moment that as he identifies it, people moved from death to life. People moved from unrighteousness to righteousness. The very thing that Paul is describing here, that through the gospel we learn how God makes man righteous in order to make us righteous, to induce us to righteousness. Paul then describes how that process went down with the Romans in chapter 6. He poses them this question in chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Do we sin more and more and more so we can get more and more grace like it's some sort of commodity to be hoarded? He says, certainly not. How shall those of us who were baptized into Christ or those of us who died to sin still live in it? Verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Keep going, verse 4. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so too we also might walk in what? Newness of life. From death to new life. The end of the chapter. You once had your fruit to unrighteousness, but now you have your fruit to righteousness. What was the moment in which they moved from death to life? What was the moment in which they moved from unrighteous to righteous? This is not to say that this is all they ever had to do. That's not Paul's point. But in every every view of salvation that we have, there has to be some punctiliar, some, some, some moment in time where the transition happens where I go from sinner to saint. And in the book of Romans, how did people go from unrighteous to righteous? Yes, it was by faith, but at what moment in faith? They were baptized into Christ, buried with him in baptism into his death, and they raised to what? New life. That's faith. Faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, Paul says in Colossians chapter 2. In the gospel, the means by which God makes man righteous, God's righteousness by faith is revealed in order to induce man to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. In his 18th century work on the book of Romans, a man by the name of James McKnight said this, The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes because righteousness, because the righteousness of God's appointment by faith is revealed in the gospel in order to produce faith. And to this righteousness, the Jews cannot object since it is written, but the just shall live by faith. God has always justified men and women. He has always justified sinners by means of faith. What that faith looks like was different throughout the years. What Abraham's faith looked like in practical terms 
and what he had to do in order to be made righteous by God for that first time looks different than David. It looks different than you and me. But it is still nonetheless justification by God's grace by means of faith. And here's the beautiful thing about what God offers. It's just exactly what righteousness is. God offers us forgiveness. God offers us purity. God offers us grace. He offers us the gracious offer of our sins being taken away. He doesn't he does not offer us a blanket where the sin is is just kind of covered. He doesn't offer us a Jesus umbrella where God looks down from heaven and he doesn't see my life or your life, he just sees the life of Jesus. That's not what he offers us. What he offers us is just exactly what Paul has described here. He offers us what? Righteousness. To where what we might have been and what we might have done in his eyes is gone. It no longer defines us. It no longer has to define us. In his mind, it is removed from us as far as the east is from the west. That's what God offers. That's righteousness. Someone says, well, that that just seems like too much. But remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 18? The story of Pharisee, the, the tax collector. Right, Two men went down to pray. God, I thank you I'm not like this man, the Pharisee said. What was the tax collector doing? He would not so much as lift his eyes to heaven, but he beat upon his breast and loudly exclaimed, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And what did Jesus say? I tell you that this man went to his house, what? Justified. That's what we've been talking about tonight, isn't it? The just, the righteous shall live by faith. This man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exhausted. Exhausted? Exalted. Some of you are exhausted. I am too. So let's wrap it up. He went to his house justified. That's what it's about. It's about being justified. It's about being made righteous. And that's what God offers us. That's what God graciously offers us. That's what God graciously offers us through faith. And so God then calls upon you and me to exercise faith. Faith in Him. Faith in His Son. Faith in the blood. Faith that He will do for us just exactly what He said. If you've not come to Jesus Christ, if you've not washed in the blood, if you've not been buried with Him in baptism and raised to walk a new life, if you've not had faith in Him, could we invite you to share in that this evening, to find in Jesus your hope, to find in Jesus your salvation and your forgiveness and the means by which God will make you righteous. Maybe as a Christian you look at your life and you haven't been living as you should. Maybe you need to do like the, like the publican and pray for God's forgiveness. And maybe you'd like us to pray with you. If we can help you respond to the gospel in any way tonight, would you come while we stand?